From traditional Sanger sequencing to next generation sequencing methods like Illumina and PacBio and Oxford Nanopore, when it comes to DNA sequencing, there's many a technique. So today, here's a look at what makes each technique unique. So a caveat is that the average read length is always changing the order of which is longest and which is most accurate. This is always changing. Um, and so take this part with a grain of salt. But the key thing is that there are different methods that we can use to sequence DNA. These different methods use different technologies, have different pros and cons. And we can combine methods in order to take advantage of, say, the high accuracy of Sanger sequencing and the long read lengths of nanopore so that we can combine these methods, combine these short read methods with these long read methods in order to kind of piece together the short reads that we get from some of the um, short read methods onto like a kind of scaffold that we get from a longer read method, even if that longer read method is less accurate. This way we're able to kind of piece together those smaller reads where if you have a read that say, is has a repetitive sequence, you might be part of it. You might be able to this way, be able to figure out where it goes by using that longer read as a scaffold. These techniques are gonna use diverse methods, but they're all going to take advantage of the natural ability of DNA to act as a template for itself. And so DNA, our cells take advantage of this property all the time in order to copy our DNA when cells divide. How this works is that there are four DNA letters or deoxyribonucleotides. And each of these letters, so there's a G, an A, a T, and a C, and they can act, they have a complementary base, which basically they're going to have a letter that specifically matches with them. And so if you know the sequence of one strand of DNA, you can kind of use it as a template for making the other thanks to that one-to-one -one pairing. And so if you have a strand of DNA, you're able to use that as a template to make a complementary strand, strand, which then you can use to make the original strand. And if our cells do this in our bodies, and we can do this in the laboratory, and we often take advantage of this in the laboratory in a technique called PCR, where we can make lots and lots of copies of DNA by making a copy of the complementary strand, then using that as a copy uh, to make a copy of the original strand, and using that as a copy to make a complementary strand, and over and over in all these cycles to get a large amount of DNA. In the case of DNA sequencing, we can use a strand as a template to make another strand. But by doing so, what we can do is instead of just trying to make a lot of copies, we can actually try to spy on it as it gets made and read out the sequence as those bases are getting made. Now, those bases can only get made if those nucleotides have a 3' OH. So what differentiates DNA from RNA is the presence or absence of a 2' OH. So in this 2' position in the RNA, you have this hydroxyl group, this OH group. And in the DNA, you don't. But this part isn't needed in order for these letters to link up into chains, which is why we can get chains of DNA. And in fact, what's the thing that's needed for this linking together is going to be the 3' OH. And DNA still has this 3' OH. And this 3' OH, basically, it's going to be what attacks the um, what attacks the incoming nucleic acid, the incoming nucleotide. And so this is going to then, with the phosphate groups, you're going to provide the energy that's needed to form this bond. So the key thing is that we have a 3' OH, we're able to form a bond to an incoming nucleotide, and this is going to release phosphate groups. And this is going to be the same sort of reaction that we're going to rely on in our sequencing methods we're going to rely on having a free 3 prime OH. And in some of the methods, we're going to rely on measuring the release of these phosphate groups. But how these different technologies do this are going to differ. So let's start with the traditional sequencing, the Sanger sequencing. This uses dideoxynucleotides or chain terminators. And this technique, um, it's, the classic technique, it actually, instead of using dye terminators, it used like radioactive nucleotides. But nowadays we use dyes. And what these dyes are is basically they're labeling each of the different DNA letters. So the A, the C, the T, and the G. But they're only labeling 
modified versions of the letters. So in these modified versions, there's no three prime OH. So they're dideoxy. They don't have that two prime OH, and this is what makes them DNA instead of RNA. But then they also don't have this three prime OH. And if they don't have that three prime OH, well, then they can't link up to an X DNA letter. And so you wouldn't want to put all of these deoxynucleotides into them because then you wouldn't be able to make anything. But if you put mostly deoxynucleotides to so the normal DNA letters, but then a handful of these, um, a handful of these terminator nucleotides that don't the dideoxy, well now you can't. Um, now there's going to make different lengths. They're going to the DNA polymerase is going to start making copies until it using those normal DNA letters until it picks up one of those abnormal ones. And when it picks up one of those terminator ones, well, now it's going to stop and it's going to stop and it can't add anything else on. And because that dideoxynucleotide is also labeled, well, this way, now you're actually going to be able to see where the DNA stopped, what letter the DNA polymerase stopped on. And so by adding a mixture of these normal letters and of these abnormal letters, you can then kind of read out where all of these pieces ended. And so traditionally this would be done um, in these like long gels. And so it was an issue with the radioactivity. Um, and then on these long gels, we're still using um, with, with fluorescent molecules and then kind of like reading them out. And nowadays these are done in like capillary gels. So kind of like one of those long gels where you're separating things by size, but it's being done in these little tiny like capillary tubes and things like that. So that's the basics of Sanger sequencing. And we often use this when we, it's really good. It's kind of like considered gold standard, but you only get shortish reads, um, about 500 to 1,000 bases. We often use it when sequencing um, plasmids. And so I talked more about that in yesterday's post that I will link to. But so that was Sanger sequencing, and there are other methods of sequencing too. So a common method is Illumina. So so that was Sanger sequencing, and that's like traditional sequencing. And then we start getting into things that we call like next generation sequencing or NGS. And there are different forms of this. One of the key players is Illumina, and they do what's called sequencing by synthesis. So again, they're going to use terminator nucleotides, dideoxynucleotides, but they're going to use reversible ones. So in the case of Sanger sequencing, we had permanently terminator nucleotide. So if you add one of those, you stop. And so each of those strands is going to be a different length and they're going to be these different length strands. In the case of Illumina, all your strands are going to basically be the same length because what you're doing is instead of just permanently stopping it, you're stopping it temporarily. So you can read out what signal was added, then you are removing that blocking group and then adding more. So how it typically works is you're going to take a lot of DNA, long DNA and you're going to shear it into fragments. So basically you um, break it up into smaller pieces because Illumina is going to give you short reads as well. Um, but these are going to be actually even shorter reads. And it's going to basically, you're going to break up this DNA into these smaller pieces and then you add on adapters to the end. And these adapters are going to make it so that they can, these DNA pieces will kind of hook up to, hook up to a chip. And so when they're on the chip, what's going to happen is that there's co this complicated chemistry and stuff that's going to make it so that you're kind of making lots and lots of copies of that different piece of DNA in, in, on the spot. And so this is done through a technique kind of like PCR, but it's isothermal. So you're not doing up and down and up and down in temperature, it stays a single temperature and you get this kind of amplification of that original sequence. Thankfully, normally there's like a barcode on here. So you can tell if you're getting um, kind of artifacts just by having a lot of amplification at this step rather than having a lot of copies of the DNA, which can come in handy if you're trying to uh, measure abundance rather than just get the sequence. But that's just a technical note. So you get this sort of cluster amplification where you're getting lots of copies of that same piece of DNA on the spot. But this is just kind of like the prep phase. You're not actually reading it out yet. We're just getting enough copies so that we'll be able to get enough of a signal in order to read out. And then you go into the sequencing of the fragments. Basically, once you have a lot of those copies, you're going to add those, those dideoxynucleotides um, and you're 
um, basically what's going to happen here is that you're going to add all of the abnormal ones and they're all going to be labeled. But what's going to happen is that these, the, that the blocking part is going to be reversible. So what's going to happen is that the matching one will get added to the growing chain and then the non-matching ones will get washed off. And so you can see what got added by measuring the fluorescence. So by measuring the light given off by the different, by the letters, they have a different light. So you can see what got added. And then you can basically remove that fluorophore and the protecting group so that it's non-terminating. So now that three prime OH is a is it free again? And then you can go and you can add the next letter and you can do this again and again in cycles. The actual technology for this is often is always changing so that they're able to measure multiple letters at once, um, various dye technologies that are making it more efficient and more accurate and things like this. And so check out Illumina's details. I'm not even gonna try to go into them because they're constantly changing and evolving and getting better and it's a complicated um, dye chemistry and things like this. But the basic idea is that you're doing this sort of sequencing by synthesis where you're reading out the DNA as it's getting made, like directly, whereas with saying or sequencing, you're kind of reading it out after the fact, and you have to rely on lots of different pieces of DNA of different length, whereas here you're kind of just reading these piece by like letter by letter by letter by letter, um, but all of kind of the same length and happening at lots and lots of places. Um, the same reaction happening over and over and over in these different spots on the chip. Once you get these short reads, then you can kind of line them up, find those overlapping regions. This is also where it comes in handy if you have a larger scaffold, something with a longer read, um, something like a nanopore read, say. But that's the basics of an Illumina sequencing. Another method is PacBio. So PacBio uses what's called single molecule real-time sequencing or SMRT. And again, we're going to be adding the, we're going to be reading the fluorescence as, as it's written. But here we're actually going to be reading it as the letter is added, not after the letter gets added. So with Sanger sequencing, we were adding, we were reading it after all of the letters got added, like in all these different reaction mixtures. And then with Illumina, basically we're adding, we're reading the letter after, after each letter gets read, gets added. But after the fact, you have to then measure it. With PacBio, we're actually measuring it directly as it's getting added, not after it gets added, but as it's directly getting added. And what happens is that basically the label is going to be on the phosphate part. And so on that part that we said gets removed when these bases are added together. And so this label, when, these, when this gets added, this is going to get released directly as in the process of adding the letter. And so as that label gets removed, you're going to see that you're going to lose the light. And so if you have DNA polymerase kind of like above this um, excitation laser, how a fluorophore works is that you shine light at one wavelength and it gives off light at another wavelength. And so you can be shining light at the wavelength that this fluorophore likes. And what's going to happen is that by depending on whether which letter gets added, you're going to see whether which you're going to see the label um, come and go and things like that. And so you're going to see a pulse of light telling you which letter got added. So that's PacBio. And finally, I wanna tell you about nanopores. This is like Oxford nanopore and things like this, which is going to read the changes in the current as letters pass through a pore. So we don't actually have any modifications here. There's no labels, there's no anything like this. It's just taking advantage of the natural chemistry of DNA. And how it works is basically what happens is that as the DNA, the DNA is going to travel through a protein pore. And so are ions or charged particles. And this the movement of charged particles, the movement of ions is what we call an electric current. But the DNA is also moving through this pore. And so the DNA is going to kind of block the current from flowing. And this different letters have different sizes and different properties. And so they're going to block the current to different extents. So by measuring the current that's flowing through this protein channel, you can tell what DNA letters are in the pore as it travels through. So basically there's like an unwinder protein above this pore. It's going to help sing, strand a single, thread a single strand of DNA through the pore. The DNA is going to block the current, but it's not fully, but it's going to kind of affect the current flow. And depending on which DNA letters are in this tunnel, you'll get different effects on the current.
And so by measuring the current and the differences in the current, you can tell what letters were in the four as it travels through. And so it's not just going to be like the immediate letter, but you can also have like combinations of DNA letters. And so then there's like computational stuff that goes into determining the actual sequence. Um, this is also useful for like RNA and there's useful for like finding modifications in DNA because all of this stuff can influence how, how the current is, um, how the current flows through. What's nice about nanopore is you can get long reads and you don't have to do any sort of like preamplification. So with Illumina and stuff, when you're doing all that cluster sequencing, you're doing a lot of amplification before the fact. Even before that cluster phase, you have to like create libraries where you're doing PCR amplification. And basically there's a lot of ways that you can get um, biased in terms of whether the adapters like it, it's a certain reads better, whether they're not um, some of them amplify better than others. Um, with nanopore, you don't have to worry about those artifacts because you are not doing anything to the DNA, but you do have a lower input amount then. You can get really long sequencing reads, um, but with higher er error, although like all the techniques, this is getting better and better. It's often used as a scaffold for aligning these shorter, more accurate reads. Um, so that's the basics of DNA sequencing. So in Sanger sequencing, we're going to be reading the last letter of a bunch of different strands of DNA. And so we're gonna have a bunch of strands that we're going to have strands of DNA, and we're going to start making copies of them. But we're not, we're going to fool the DNA polymerase by adding some DNA letters that are chain terminators, these dideoxynucleotides, where if the polymerase incorporates one of these, well, now it can't incorporate any others. And these dideoxynucleotides are also going to be labeled so if we separate all those pieces by size and we have all these pieces so that we started copying at the same place, well, now if we read out the last letter and we know how big the piece is, we can then read out the actual sequence at the end. And so basically we make all these different strands and all these strands are going to add in a different letter. We separate these strands by size, such as with capillary electrophoresis typically these days, which is kind of like a gel, but in a long thin tube. Um, and then we are able to read out the sequence. With Illumina, they use sequencing by synthesis. So here we're also going to be using terminator, diterminator nucleotides, but in this case, the termination is re reversible. So we're reading the same strand letter by letter by letter. We add one letter, we read it out, we remove the blocking group, we add another letter, we read it out, we remove the blocking group, we add another letter, we read it out, we remove the blocking group. And so this is how you, the Illumina sequencing is going to read out these different letters all in the same strand as opposed to on different strands. With PacBio, you're also going to be using fluorescence, but in this case, the fluorophore is going to be attached to the phosphorus group, the phosphate group, that group that's going to be removed as the base is added. So as the base is added, you're basically going to see that you're going to get this fluorescence as that fluorophore gets added, but then that fluorophore is going to get broken off. And so you're going to get like a pulse of fluorescence. And this can be detected by kind of trapping the polymerase reaction going on in, in, on top of a laser. And therefore you can detect which letter gets added. But then once it gets added, you get that pulse and you get that release. And now you can add another letter, get another pulse, another release. And so you're able to therefore measure the making of the DNA copy. In the case of a nanopore, there's no fluorophores involved. Instead, you're just taking advantage of the natural DNA and its ability to kind of block a pore. And so what happens is that there's going to be this membrane with this channel protein and this protein on the top is gonna to kind of help unwind things and thread a single strand of DNA through the pore. Now, as the DNA travels through the pore, it's competing with ions or the ions are competing with it more because these ions, these charged particles are gonna be really tiny and the DNA is gonna be bigger and bulkier. The DNA is gonna block the path of these ions. And when ions are moving, we call this electrical current. And so the DNA, how much is in it and what letters are in it is going to dictate how much, um, so what letters are in the tunnel is going to dictate how much of the channel was blocked and going to alter the path, the current. And by measuring changes in the current, you can then tell which DNA letters were in that tunnel. And so it reads the changes in currents as the letters pass through the pore. And this is going to give you um, long reads from native DNA, but there could be more errors. And so it's often combined with some of these shorter read technologies that have a higher accuracy, 
combining methods to use longer reads as scaffolds for placing together the smaller reads. So the technology is always changing. And so make sure that you stay up to date if you care about which is really like how much more accurate one is than another and that sort of thing. I'm not claiming to be an expert in it or anything, but hopefully this helped you understand the basic biochemistry behind it all.